You're listening to the Hayek Program Podcast. This podcast includes audio from lectures, interviews, and discussions from scholars and visitors of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. To learn more about the Hayek Program, visit hayek.mercatus.org. To learn about graduate student fellowship opportunities with the Mercatus Center at George Mason University for students at Mason as well as at universities across the globe, please visit students.mercatus.org. Jamie Lemke, recording on November 16th, 2016 with Professor William Shugart. My name is Jamie Lemke. I'm a senior research fellow and associate director of academic and student programs at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. I'm also a senior fellow in the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics. And I am so pleased to be here today with William Franklin Shugart II, Professor Bill Shugart. Uh, Bill is the J. Smith Professor in Public Choice at Utah State University, um, emeritus at the University of Mississippi also the research director for the Independent Institute, and the editor-in-chief of the journal Public Choice. Um, Thank you so much for taking time to talk to me today, Bill. Thank you for being here uh, and inviting me. I appreciate (laughs) it. Yeah. Um, I would have to be here anyway, so it's extra special (laughs) that you're here. (laughs) Um, Okay, so I want to just dive right in and ask you some questions about your background with Public Choice Economics and your experiences Um, as public choice was really developing as a discipline. Um, So I want to start at the beginning and ask you kind of how you first got interested in public choice because your dissertation work at Texas A&M, which I know you're still very proud to be an alum of that institution, uh, was in labor economics. But by the time you start teaching at Clemson, you seem to be pretty strongly within the field of public choice. Um, So what motivated that shift? I'm Bob Tolleson. I started uh, my dissertation work in labor because I had just been discharged from the U.S. Navy in uh, at the end of 1975. And uh, well, my last two years in the Navy, I was stationed in D.C. the whole time. I worked at the Pentagon delivering mail for three years. And then I found out about a think tank uh, in Roslyn, Virginia, called the Center for Naval Analyses. Uh, It's now called CNA Corp. Uh, But at at the time uh, I I was there, uh, it was pretty much the Navy equivalent of the RAND Corporation. Uh, uh, So uh, while I was there, the last year, year and a half I was in the Navy, I was on the research staff at CNA and working on, at the time, uh, the all-volunteer force had just been created by uh, President Nixon. And uh, there was a lot of interest in the Navy and, and the other services of you know, how much do we have to pay to keep people in the Navy once they are to enlist in the Navy in the first place. And if they, uh, we send them to a school and they develop you know, technical skills uh, in nuclear power or uh, any other uh, uh, field, uh, we w- would like them to re-enlist. So a couple of us, uh, I worked with some of the professional staff at CNA on papers looking at bonuses required to, uh, uh, how much money required by specialty to get people to enlist or re-enlist. And so uh, I was very interested in labor economics. And I went back to uh, uh, College Station after I got discharged. I had in my mind I was going to do labor. And uh, I sought sought out uh, Art Devaney, who was on the faculty there at that time, and asked him if he would direct my dissertation once I got far enough along in the PhD program. And he said yes. And so that. My dissertation was on the Air Force manpower problem, uh, which was very similar to what was uh, questions that were being asked about uh, by the Navy. And so it just seemed like a natural thing to do. Uh, Bob Tolleson was the chair of the 
economics department at Texas A&M when I returned to graduate school. And uh, I wasn't smart enough at the time to take any courses from him or uh, to get uh, uh, start writing papers with him. Uh, so I ha had to wait for a few more years for that connection to be made. Uh, and it was made at the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, after Ronald Reagan was uh, elected to the presidency, he appointed Jim Miller, James C. Miller III, a classmate of Bob's at UVA. Uh, Bob was a student uh, of Jim Buchanan, wrote his dissertation there. But Bob became, uh, Jim Miller appointed Bob as the director of the Bureau of Economics. And I was already there. I had taken a, a job as a staff economist at the FTC and we met or re-met ourselves during the fire alarm at <laughs> the building in uh, Georgetown where the Bureau of Economics was and uh, the rest is history as they say. So had you interacted with Tolleson at all while you were at A&M? Uh, in social ways, but not uh, academically. Okay, just uh, casually. Yeah, just casually. And then the world gave you a second chance almost it, by well, accident. Yeah, it did. Uh, it was a fire drill. I was a staff economist at the FTC. Bob had just been appointed, appointed as the director. And while we were all milling around out front of the bil Gilman uh, uh, building in, in Foggy Bottom, I went up and introduced myself, reintroduced myself to Bob. And he said uh, uh, he remembered me, uh, and he wanted me to come up as, to his office to talk about working directly with him in, in uh, helping him with his job as director. And uh, I went up. He gave me a memo to read. He said he gave me a test. He said summarize this memo. memo. Uh, look at the arguments. Uh, that the economists in the BE have made about this case, look at the arguments of, uh, of the lawyers, st staff on that same case, write me you know, three pages to distill down the arguments and, and then give me your opinion about what I should do. And I guess I passed the test because the next day I was appointed as a special as assistant to the director of the bureau and it started working with Bob continued that for 40 years. <laughs> okay, so w was the shift towards public choice then more of a pragmatic matter of you having been at the FTC at that time? Or was there something about the content of the discipline itself or the circumstances you were working in that contributed? Well, as I, I said, I ne had never taken a class in public choice. But Bob started throwing these out ideas out to me of how to think about what's going on at the FTC. And uh, so I, I sort of became a learning by doing public choice economist while I was at the FTC, uh, writing memoranda for Bob's signature that would go to the full commission with his recommendation as to whether the commission should drop the case, prosecute, uh, or whatever action recommended ac action to take. And I quickly became uh, aware of the political influences on the commission's decisions through that experience, which sort of moved me. I mean, I, I, I did, did have a field in industrial organization in graduate school. I, was, I knew nothing about antitrust policy, but that experience moved me in that direction and moving in the direction of thinking about uh, antitrust law enforcement it, because of Bob's influence it's natural to believe, bring uh, public choice thinking uh, to that whole uh, pr process. So how much did your time, did, how much did the experiences you had in the Navy and at the FTC collectively have those continued to influence how you think about the operation of government? Uh, not so much the Navy. I, I put that behind me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I do it, but I, I did it, but I wouldn't do it again. Uh, but I had to avoid the draft uh, uh, in the fall of 1969, and 
that was the best option. It allowed me to, uh, listing in the Navy, I was not an officer, listing in the Navy allowed me to sign on the sign up, get the draft notice canceled, but I didn't have to go on active duty for up to six months. And that gave me time to finish my master's thesis at, uh, at Texas A&M, which I did on intellectual property, uh, directed by Mel Greenhut and uh, Risa uh, on the faculty, and Bob Eakland, uh, who is my lifelong friend. Uh, maybe I've known Bob Eakland longer than, about a year longer than I've known Bob Tolleson. Uh, and uh, I tell Bob Eakland that he convinced me that I could be a good economist, because when I was an undergraduate, I took intermediate micro, a uh, macro from him, using Gardner Ackley's intermediate macro book, and I got a B in that class. Uh, I got A's in all my micro classes. And so, I, you know, the fact that Bob gave me a B actually was a signal that I, I could be a good economist. <laughs> <laughs> um. But the FTC experience, I mean, I've been living on that ever since to a uh, greater or lesser extent. Uh, uh, by, not, by, you know, involved in a lot of uh, cases uh, that uh, when I was at the commission, um, the uh, shared monopoly case against Kellogg, General Foods, General Mills, uh, major producers of breakfast cereal, uh, the merger between Mobile Oil Company and Marathon Oil Company, which the commission ev eventually opposed, uh, and uh, uh, those cases and going back and looking at, at theories of I.O. and micro to uh, think about those cases and then adding in uh, public choice ideas uh, uh, you know, led me eventually to publish uh, a, an I.O. textbook that has a lot of public choice content in it uh, and also wrote a uh, – published the same year, 1990, uh, a book called uh, uh, Antitrust Policy and Interest Group Politics. You know, summarize what I had learned up to that point uh, about the influences, polit po political influences on law enforcement. Uh, how much have you been involved since then with any of the regulatory or legislative agencies? Have you done consulting? Uh, expert testimony? I, I have done expert te testimony in antitrust cases. Uh, Were you successful? Uh, partly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I won some cases, help win some cases. Uh, I always, in antitrust, you want to work for the defendant because the, the uh, plaintiff is either going to be the government, FTC, or the Department of Justice, or a competitor of the firm that's being accused of monopolizing a market or doing stuff like that, uh, violating the law in, in uh, various ways. Uh, so I did get some practical experience. I, I lost a big case uh, in federal district court in uh, Jackson, Mississippi, uh, while I was still living there, uh, uh, involving uh, uh, casino gaming. Poker, poker uh, games played at a table against the house, not against other players, and uh, did analysis of the relevant market, and uh, I thought it was a very sound analysis, but the, uh, the, the plaintiff in the case, which was a, 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 guy a guy who had been a professional poker player all his life, and it, the inventor of what the game called three card poker, uh, uh, his significant other, a woman, testified on the stand and broke down in tears. And it just, she just wrung the jury's heartstrings. <laughs> and it didn't matter how good my analysis was, uh, they, they, the, the plaintiff won that case.
Yeah, I was I was going to guess that this is going in the direction of your ideas not being able to prevail over the interest, but I guess your right. ideas just couldn't match up to the uh, the emotion. Right. So uh, that was the last to uh, next to last time that I testified in court. Uh, the last time that the experience was so bad because of the lawyer I was working with, I just decided I, this is not worth it anymore. And so I've, I've stopped doing consulting. I have testified on electricity deregulation in the state of Mississippi years ago, uh, uh, but uh, not much experience with that either. All right, I want to transition a little bit into talking about some of the research you've done. Um, so I was reading over your CV over the past couple of days, getting ready for this conversation. I can barely carry the thing. <laughs> it's about 50 pages here, I think, of different kinds of topics you've researched. Um, this is not even the specific topics, but just some of the theories you've worked with, regulation, rent-seeking, trade, taxation, legal institutions, antitrust policy, competitive government, um, higher education, sports economics. Um, is there in your mind, or, or how would you define the unifying theme? Kind of what fits into the Bill Shugart research agenda? Any applied micro theory and, uh, and public choice. I mean, my, I uh, have such a diversity of, of papers and research interests. Again, that's Bob Tollison's influence. His, his his CV is twice as long as mine. You would need a uh, a, a truck hand truck to bring it in here if you uh, wanted to, but he he's the same per same type of person. Is it an interesting question to think about? Doesn't really matter what the application is, and he's done religion, he's done sports, he's done antitrust, he's done. Uh, History of thought, uh, you know, the, the gamut of he he. Uh, one of the rem remembrances I've written about him, I, I liken him to Gordon Tullock in terms of his uh, being an economic imperialist, uh, wanting to apply the ra model of rational choice to many areas uh, that are outside the traditional realm of economic theory, and I sort of picked that up from, from Bob. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, I think if I had one focus stream, you know, of health education, higher education, uh, or, uh, you know, uh, international trade or whatever, I would quickly have become bored uh, working on the intensive margin of research rather than ex the extensive margin where you, you, you know, the whole world is, op is available for thinking about. Uh, and, uh, you know, I recognize that I jump all over the place in my research, but that's that's Bob's model, and, and I followed it uh, pretty closely. I mean, he and I, uh, <coughs> in 2007, was his 65th birthday, and uh, between the econ department at Clemson uh, and Public Choice, me, uh, the journal, uh, we ha had a two- or three-day conference with papers being presented in his honor, not only by former students and colleagues, but by c current students at Clemson. And uh, again, you can look at, the, uh, we, we eventually that best shrift, that special issue was published in 2010, and uh, just flip through that, and there are papers all over the street uh, in terms of topics, but they're all unified by uh, in very one way or another, being applications of micro theory with a public choice twist to them, uh, and uh, one of the papers that was presented at that conference, I don't like want to 
act like I'm doing self-promotion here, but it was... Uh, oh, please, where else are you going <laughs> to self-promote if not on your own, <laughs> your if own I, interview? If, if I don't do it for myself, who else is going <laughs> to do it? Uh, uh, was written by Nicole and, and Mark Crane. And the original title of the paper was Bob Tolleson, colon, an empirical analysis. And what they did was go through his CV, look at his research productivity over time, uh, and it was starting to peak a little bit uh, in when at the age of 65, but it was still, the slope was positive. Uh, and he looked at, you know, one of Bob's characteristics was that he had so many good ideas for research that he couldn't possibly have carried them out by himself uh, from start to finish. And he's not an econometrician. Uh, he's not a mathematician. He's an idea person. And so he would uh, assemble a set of one or more co-authors for particular papers that uh, uh, you know, were, were uh, brought complementary skills to the table to him, to him, whether it's empirical, whether it's modeling, uh, whatever. And uh, so he's had uh, something on the order of 500 co-authors over the course of his academic career. And uh, according to Crane and Crane, I'm number one on that list. He and I published in excess of 60 papers uh, uh, in uh, the period that we were associated from basically FTC days in uh, early 70s to last month when he passed away. Yeah, well, looking at your CV, that's not surprising at all. <laughs> so if he was the idea man, what was your role in the specialization? Uh, uh, early on, it was econometrics. I mean, running regressions, doing empirical tests of the ideas. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good at math, but I, I don't think that way. So uh, somebody like Richard Higgins, which was a colleague of ours at the FTC, he could write down a model for anything you, you, you wanted to, uh, a, a, a theoretical model for any uh, idea that Bob had. And so Richard was the mod, uh, math guy in collaboration. I was the empirical guy. Later on, I became, uh, moved away from that because you know, econometric technology was advancing much fast, faster than I was. Uh, I became the, uh, I, I think I was a better writer than Bob. Uh, so I would uh, draft papers. Uh, we would talk about uh, organization. And basically, uh, even early on, when Bob would suggest an idea to him, I would take that idea uh, back to my office. And pretty much a month later, I would hand him the first draft of the of the paper. We talk about it. He says, "Well, you, this this is parts too long. This you left something out here." We would discuss it, and uh, I'd revise it. We send it out. Uh, later on, he decided never uh, he he never uh, made those kind of comments again because he was satisfied with my first draft. Uh, he trained you well. Yeah, he did. <laughs> I mean, and he learned that from Jim Buchanan. The idea, uh, Jim once said, if you uh, have an idea, it's a dream until you get it down on paper. Uh, and, you know, if you wanted to talk to Jim about a, a research idea, he didn't walk into his office, start talking, you would write up a page or a page or two, hand it to him and say uh, to him that, you know, I think this is a good idea. What do you think? And he, he would take your two-page summary, read it, and then we would talk the next day about it. Because, uh, you know, uh, I think Bruce Anvil uh, uh, 
quotes Buchanan saying, if you're, if you're not writing, you're not thinking. Uh, and Bob thought a lot. And he had the worst handwriting in the world. But I, <laughs> I learned when he would, you know, sketch out some ideas, I eventually learned how to uh, decipher them. But uh, he never wrote on the computer, as far as I know. You walk into his office, he would have a yellow notepad on his desk, and he would have a bunch of sharpened pencils and maybe a couple of red pens or green pens, some different color. And he would sit there and write on every other line of the pad. And uh, eventually he would give it to his wife, Anne, to type up so that other human beings could actually <laughs> read what he had written. Uh, but I eventually learned how to figure that out. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I passed ideas to him from time to time that he thought were interesting, and we would do a paper on that idea. All right, well, I definitely want to talk more about both uh, Tolleson and Buchanan and probably Tulloch too when we talk about the Public Choice Center. Oh, but first yeah. I want to follow up just a little bit on uh, the description you gave of your research, which was applied micro with a public choice twist. So I want to ask for you, what does it mean to have a public choice twist? Because I think it's probably not just the word government is in the paper. Right. It's, uh, you know, rational behavior outside of markets outside of a formal market setting. And it could be corporate boards of directors, it could be uh, legislatures, it could be committees. Uh, the idea that you know, everybody is self-interested by and large, although they're thickly self-interested, not thinly, not just wealth or income maximizers. Uh, and uh, the idea is to use that mindset of rational choice and and apply it an anywhere, anywhere. Uh, I mean, we've written, Bob and I wrote a paper uh, called Economics in English, which uh, subtitle is uh, you know, Economics of Language Growth, and sort of took Hayekian spontaneous uh, language development uh, uh, a spontaneous order, looked at the, the uh, I got, got a data set, uh, the second edition of the Oxford uh, Economics Dictionary, at one time had a searchable CD, and you could search by uh, nouns, verbs, adverbs, blah, 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 and look, look, looked at the growth of the language o over time in terms of the number of words in the in the OED from as early as we could go back up until uh, the late 20th century and uh, looked at the impact of uh, foreign trade on words. We get, they're called loan words from other languages that uh, people that, you know, a, a, a Brit transact transacting with a, a Frenchman uh, what might pick up in a, in a conversation and uh, bring it back and eventually becomes incorporated into the English language in dictionary form. Of course, language develops first orally, and it's only later that through use words become accept meanings of words become accepted. Uh, sometimes they change over time, but they end up in the dictionary. And the nice thing about the OED data set was uh, for every word, there's an illust illustrative quotation, a sentence, uh, where uh, is the earliest use of that word in, r in writing. And you can search by those dates. Uh, see the words coming into the language. Some words disappear, but not very many. Uh, and so the net growth of the English language, and what can you explain that in terms of expansion of market opportunity? 
for the uh, for the English speaking people. Uh, so that uh, uh, we have quotations from Hamlet in there. Uh, my Lord, words, 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 words. Uh, we have quotations from Hayek talking about similarities between the development of language and the development of mediums of exchange, money. Uh, and so, I mean, that's it's applied micro in the sense that you international trade, but it's also uh, Austrian and uh, public choice in the sense that you think about how language and, tr and try to explain how language develops over time. So it sounds like you think about public choice as in its original intent of encompassing all kinds of non-market behavior. Yes. Although not, not necessarily s isolated from markets, as right. your example illustrates. Okay. Um, so over the course of your research agenda, have your research interests or your priorities changed in important ways? Uh, well, early on, it was very focused on antitrust and, and, and law enforcement, the behavior of the Federal Trade Commission and the behavior of the Department of Justice. Uh, I think the next stage was looking at legislatures, U.S. Congress, uh, looking at the economics profession itself, uh, Bob uh, and I and David LeBan, uh, did papers on uh, sort of uh, citation practices in the field of economics. Uh, uh, but but uh, so antitrust and, and law enforcement has is dying off as part of my research agenda because. Uh, I no, no longer get involved with that as directly as I did in the past, uh, but uh, uh, it changes uh, as I encounter students that I want to work with and have uh, uh, skills to bring to the table, uh, 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 selective incentives for businesses to locate in state X rather than state Y. Uh, economics of the newspaper industry uh, in Denver, Colorado, <laughs> which, uh, like Salt Lake City, has are, 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 are two of the few very few cities in the country that still have two, two newspapers. But they only have two news newspapers because they're allowed to pollute. They're allowed by the Justice Department has a program uh, that allows newspapers that are in danger of failing uh, to apply to operate jointly with the other, other paper in town. And uh, they s are share production facilities, they share advertising uh, uh, and they, all, uh, they s share reporting. The only thing they're not supposedly not allowed to share is editorial content. had a graduate student in at Mississippi that did a paper that ended up in a uh, term paper that actually ended up in the uh, antitrust antitrust bulletin on on newspapers in Denver uh, so you no know, I, I, I have I have not focused on any th any one topic ever uh, and I'm still not doing that I still do what is interesting and in which I can, like Bob, find somebody nowadays to do the high-powered econometrics or uh, math. Uh, and uh, I've also been, uh, in the last three or four years, working with a lot of students at Utah State uh, writing op-eds for local and national media. And I I think it's a great way to help students learn how to write and how, you know, in 600 words to uh, concisely 
explain an idea. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, before we get too much further along, since we are at George Mason, I definitely want to make sure we get the chance to talk about the time you spent here in the Department of Economics and at the Center for the Study of Public Choice. So what was your relationship with the Center for the Study of Public Choice when you moved to George Mason in 1985? Well, I had... Uh, Moved to Clemson with Bob after the FTC, about a year later after he, he moved there. And they were, we were at Clemson for a couple of years, and he moved back to Mason to become the director of the Center for Study of Public Choice. And I had just, on the basis of the first article that Bob and I published, which was in the AER, uh, had gotten promet promoted from assistant to associate at Clemson after one year. Uh, on faculty. I didn't have tenure, but Bob came to Mason, wanted me to come up, found a place for me. So I moved up and became uh, uh, part of the center. I was appointed as a associate professor of economics without tenure in the econ department. So I also had a joint appointment in the, in the Public Choice Center uh, in uh, George's Hall old university chapel, where we prayed <laughs> at the uh, feet of Gordon and, and Jim. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, I uh, came there in 1980, fall of 1985, I believe it was, and stayed for three years till the fall of 88. Uh, so I was present at, uh, at center when Jim won, won the Nobel Prize in 1986. Pretty darn exciting time, uh, I tell you. And uh, there were reporters cr crawling all over the center that day. And uh, one, one, one of them wanted a copy of the calculus of consent. I handed him my Ann Arbor paperback. And so on CNN that that night, if you're watching, that was my copy of the calculus <laughs> that was on the on the news. Uh, so uh, I only had one office in George's Hall. I worked w walked there every day. Mostly, I taught in the master's program down in Arlington, in the old uh, department store building down there. That was the law school's original location the only law school in the country with an escalator at the time. Uh, uh, and uh, so, uh, but if I wasn't teaching, didn't have a class, I was in my office at the center. Uh, Bob was the director, Dick Wagner was there, Gordon was there, Jim was there, uh, uh, Mark Crane, shared an office with me. <laughs> uh, there's only a thin partition between them. Uh, and uh, we just worked. Who were the most active voices in the center at that time? Uh, I, I've left out David Levy, uh, who was there. Uh, Dwight Lee was there for part of the time I was there. Uh, he left about a year after I'd gotten to the center and moved to Georgia. I've told him ever since that I, I know he moved because he couldn't keep up with me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he appreciates uh, yeah. that. <laughs> uh, and we joke about it all the time. I mean, Dwight insults people, in, like Gordon insults people that he likes. Uh, so, uh, so you're saying it was a very collegial environment. Yeah, it was very collegial. Uh, Jeff Brent, and we had visitors coming in all the time. Jeff Brennan was there for a year. Victor Vanberg. Peter Bernholtz, uh, uh, I'm probably leaving out names that I shouldn't leave out, but it was a very collegial environment. We had seminars every Wednesday afternoon in the chapel part of the facility, uh, and uh, you know it was just pro productivity. Ideas were fl flying around in the air from everywhere. Productivity was sky high. Uh, I think 
at, at the height of our collaboration, Bob and I were producing a paper a month. Uh, and on top of all the research Bob was doing, he was doing all the administrative work for the center. And uh, uh, in 1988, uh, I got an offer from uh, Mississippi uh, to get promoted to full professor, double my salary, and I couldn't turn it down. And so we, we moved away. Uh, uh, you know, financially I was better off, but uh, I was worse off in terms of the intellectual environment spent three years at, at, at the center. Uh, that was a great place. We had great graduate students. Uh, uh, Brian Goff, and Trey Fleischer. Uh, Kevin Greer came uh, uh, to the center as a uh, young faculty member. I mean, it was just an amazing place to be. How much of that productivity and that mood can be attributed to Buchanan having won the Nobel in 1986, and how much of it was just the sheer force of having that concentration of of yeah. intellect and personality in one center? Yeah, because it was like that before he won. It was like that after he won. I mean, it was an exciting time, and we were very happy for Jim course and for the university and for the public choice center but I don't think very many people ever m missed a beat uh, I mean we celebrated for a few days and then uh, went back to work uh, and of course Jim never backed off I mean he continued to work every day uh, until he was passed away I mean pretty much at, at the age of 93 uh, he began to spend more time down at his farm in Virginia, but uh, near Blacksburg. But one, one of the uh, goals that younger people had, and I, I was to beat Jim into the office every morning. I said, "Go get in your office, keep your door open, and so that Jim, when he, he walked down the hall to his office, could see that you were there." Uh, and I usually won that that co competition. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Jim would come in uh, early, and he would stay until probably six o'clock. Uh, and he would pound things out on an old typewriter, uh, pull it out, reread it, make corrections, and head, hand it to Betty Tillman to put in uh, uh, better put on be better paper and uh, a more neat manu uh, into a manuscript form that he could send off. So there's clearly a strong emphasis on advancing the research agenda of public choice. You mentioned there were talented graduate students there. Was educating and creating a next generation of people who were going to be able to continue with this research? How much was that a part of the conscious plan of the center, or was it really more at that time focused on developing the ideas? Uh, it was probably more focused on developing the ideas, but we didn't leave the students uh, a, a C. Uh, I mean, there was a conscious effort, especially during their dissertation year, to help them learn how to do research and be successful in academia, uh, and uh, you know, get them a good job when they when they graduate. And so, uh, you know, Bob loved his students, whether they were graduate students or undergraduate, and he consciously made an effort to get them involved in research projects to help help begin their training for when they grew up, that they'd be able to do that stuff on their own, no matter wh where they were. Uh, and, uh, you know, we uh, at the time in the 80s, I mean, we did have what we called center graduate students, and we sort of probably fought a little bit with the Center for Market Process to pick up the cream of the crop 
offer them you know funding for their dissertation year and and get them moved over to George's Hall so that they could interact with not only the person they were writing under but also the other faculty members in the uh, in, in the center um, okay so there was a little bit of competition with the center for the study of yeah, market there process yeah there was uh, <laughs> uh, Don Boudreaux was there at the time. Don Lavoy first, uh, uh, and then later on Don Boudreaux, Pete Bechke were there as graduate students, and uh, you know they were in whatever building the econ department was in at the time, uh, se separate, geographically separate from the Public Choice Center, and you know uh, that made interaction a little more difficult between the Austrian people and the public choice people. That's probably a shame, uh, but in hindsight, there wasn't as close a connection as there might have been. Uh, but uh, you know, the intellectual activity was at a very high level uh, in both places. So since it's come up, let me ask you, how you today think about that relationship between public choice, the way Buchanan and Tulloch and Tolleson and, and all the rest of the folks in the center are practicing it, and Austrian economics? Yeah. Uh, well, just as I never had a course in public choice, I never had a course in Austrian economics. But I was heavily influenced by Hayek, uh, 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 use of information, piece in the AER. That was like a revelation when I first read it. Uh, I think it was al already out of graduate school, but I was a young faculty member, uh, influenced by that very well, very heavily, uh, uh, and uh, also was influenced uh, by Jim's little book, Cost and Choice, about Opportunity cost being a subjective concept that only the chooser knows what the next best alter alternative was at the time they made a choice. Uh, uh, I don't consciously put uh, uh, Austrian economics often in references of stuff I'm writing, but I do. I mean, uh, uh, and uh, I. I I like the uh, I think the approaches of public choice and Austrian Austrianism uh, are very similar in the sense that uh, focused on how human beings make choices within institutional constraints uh, uh, and uh, so I, I, you know, there, there's a close connection. Uh, Don Boudreaux and I, when he was here uh, in the Market Process Center, and I was in the Public Choice Center, we did a paper together uh, on monetary policy, uh, which is pretty Austrian in, in the sense that the main point of the paper was that uh, the relationship between rates of inflation volatility of prices around that general trend in prices over time and how uh, uh, that creates an incentive for vertical integration uh, in firms. If market prices are volatile and rising, it's very much harder for entrepreneurs, decision makers uh, to enter into contracts with arm's length with others, with suppliers or customers. So uh, we, we found some evidence that as inflation rises and price volatility goes up, the uh, uh, extent to which firms vertically integrate goes up. Uh, so uh, I think that was Don's first publication, actually. Uh, uh, and I've known him since you know, the mid-80s. Mid He 
and I once competed for the chairmanship of the econ department here, and he won. Uh, I think, that I, in hindsight, I'm glad he, he won that competition because I think I'd be a lousy uh, department head. But they did it one year, and I hated it at Ole Miss. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, opportunity cost of holding the fa hand of a faculty member or a student when I could be writing or reading was just too high. Yeah. So many, much a lot of work in Austrian econ in ec economics has been critical of methods that rely on aggregation or right. on the creation of a, a social welfare function. Of course, that criticism is in public choice also. Right. And also critical of the ability to identify independent of choice, even an individual's welfare function. So right. are those critiques that um, resonate with you? I know, And I know they often, uh, it can be difficult to conduct some types of empirical work uh, without running into some of those possible criticisms. H how do you think about navigating that? Well, I, uh, as the whole time I've been editor of Public Choice, which goes back to 2005. Uh, if the paper's got a social welfare function in it or a planner, it gets desk rejected immediately. Most of this come from Europe. European public choice people are different from American public choice people. They're much more, uh, uh, as um, McGraw uh, wrote in his biography of Schumhader, uh, they're state broken. Uh, that that is, if they, uh, the state is riding their back and they're o okay with that, by and large. Uh, I'm not. Uh, so. Uh, I hope that people that submit papers for public choice have learned that lesson, although I still get, every now and then, I get a paper uh, with a planner in it, and that paper gets rejected the, within seconds of being coming to me. Uh, but uh, like Bob, I, I like empirical work, uh, I mean, I, I, in the sense of, testing hypotheses, uh, uh, and, but I, I know, know those critiques of measurement uh, from the Austrian side of, of things. Uh, that's never been emphasized as much on the public choice side, uh, mainly because of Gordon Tullock's influence, I think. And, and through Bob, I think, you know, Bob wrote his dissertation under Jim, but I think he was more a, an heir to Gordon Tullock in terms of imperialist, imperialist, economic imperialist, and wanting to see, if at all possible, test empirical evidence of whatever issue you're talking about. Uh, so I, I continue that. Uh, uh, I mean, I can evaluate econometric models and econometric methods, even if I don't do them myself anymore. But uh, you know, it, 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 uh, I, I, I like empirical papers. I'll be honest, uh, just like Gordon did, just like Bob did. I've rejected a few for reasons other than measurement. I once had a paper that was so badly written, uh, uh, this has been eight years ago or so, came from Europe. The co-author was a big name in public choice in Europe. I'm not going to mention his n that person's name. But I think that uh, he had had a, a graduate student or a young faculty member. You know, here's an idea write it up for me. And uh, I'm not sure that this more prominent public choice person had ever read the paper before it came to me. And it was just god-awful written. 
I was about terrorism, uh, suicide terrorism. And uh, it took five times to tell the author to get this paper professionally copy edited before it was in good enough shape that I could actually read it from start to finish. And when I got to the finish, I realized that the econometrics was fatally flawed. And so I rejected it after five reviews. Uh, that's probably the, my record <laughs> in terms of rejections. Uh, but uh, you know, pure theory is fine. Voting models are fine. Uh, but if it's, it's a policy matter, I, I, I would like to see it have to be very sophisticated. But let's, let's see some numbers other than the page number that you quote. So I, this is not my intention to put words in your mouth, so I want you to react. Okay. to this statement. This is not me making a statement for you, but I want to just hear your reaction to it. Okay. Um, it's better to be interesting and clearly explained than to be trivial or dull, even if true. Correct. That's correct. Uh, Gordon wanted an interesting paper. I passed that on to Bob, and Bob passed it on to me. I mean, uh, after Gordon stepped down as editor of Public Choice in 1990, he turned it over uh, editorship uh, to Bob Tolleson and Charles Rowley uh, to handle ma manuscripts from Europe, uh, for, I'm sorry, from the United States. And l they had a separate European editor of the journal. And, you know, structurally, it was a awful, awful way of running that journal because both Charles and Bob and the European editor had independent authority to accept papers for publication. But this is before the internet. We're all doing everything by mail with a stop in both directions at Dordrecht in Holland. And, uh, you know, so Bob and Charles never knew how many papers had been accepted for publication in public choice by the European editor. The European editor didn't know how many papers that Bob and Charles had accepted. And so by the time I took over as editor a in 2005, there was a more, a more than two-year length of lag between acceptance and publication. And that just was just intolerable. And so when I, you know, you know, Gordon started the journal out of his own pocket pretty much, self-published it in Blacksburg. And then eventually uh, when the flow of manuscripts became large enough that it was no longer po possible for him personally uh, to... Uh, manage the queue, uh, get referee reports, which he didn't do very often. Uh, I can remember vividly at the center when uh, Gordon would have a paper that he was a little bit unsure of. He would just walk down the hall and hand it to me or one of the other uh, members of the faculty and ask, not for a report, you know, a written referee report, but just thumbs up or thumbs down. Uh, and, uh, you know, you know he, he, he couldn't do that anymore and still, you know, manage the journal, uh, the subscription list. He was managing that early on. He was managing uh, selling reprints of articles. And he, so he, he, he sold off the journal to, at the time, a uh, pub publisher named Martinus Nishoff. In, in in the Netherlands somewhere. Uh, and when he did that, he sold the rights to the name Public Choice. And so he, he got a lot of the backroom work off his shoulders. But it, it meant that uh, uh, separation began uh, between the center and the journal. 
which has continued to this day. Uh, I think eventually we convinced Springer to offer discounts to members of the Public Choice Society for subscriptions, but you know, the business end was being han handled out of Holland uh, for the journal, and uh, I think the membership of the society was being handled by the Public Choice Society. Do you think that disconnect has been detrimental to either the center uh, or the journal? I think it was uh, from time to time. Uh, nowadays, not so much because of uh, the fact that uh, we don't sell individual subscriptions much anymore. It's like 100, 100 copies, hard copies, every two months. Most of the subscriptions are online. Uh, there is a ability for members of the Public Choice Society to get discounts on the subscription, but I think most people don't, don't even do that because they get it through their library. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, from, the, from day one, I mean, the editor of Public Choice has been an, an ex officio member of the board, executive board of the Public Choice Society, and uh, beginning with Charles uh, Rowley and continuing on with me, I give a report to the board, uh, executive board, every year in March at our, at our meeting, and uh, you know, so that it's not a complete divide, but we run our business pretty much independently of one another. Uh, I'm sure that has benefits. I'm sure it has costs. I can't. Uh, Ain't that the way. I, d I don't <laughs> <laughs> know what the net effect is, whether uh, maybe net effect may be neutral uh, rather than uh, benefits greater than or less than the cost. I, 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 I can't judge. Uh, but... Uh, Charles was editor. He got, by that, that time, Martin Snitchhoff had been acquired by Kluwer, who in turn had been acquired by Springer, and uh, convinced Springer to uh, create a Gordon Tullock Prize for the best paper by younger scholars, in, uh, which I award every year. And the winner of the prize is uh, sort of a consensus between me and three associate editors, we award that, uh, and we also award a Duncan Black Prize to uh, senior scholars for best paper in the previous calendar year. And so uh, a lot of the winners of those things have been associated with George Mason at one time or another. And so, uh, yeah, uh, we, we keep, keep the lines of communication open. Uh, Public Choice Society has, for a period of time, during the uh, uh, up to say about eight years ago, was in danger of bankruptcy almost every year uh, because they only made money on the conference, uh, on, on registration fees at the conference, and they were in, in danger several times uh, because. People that attend the conference are rational actors. If they could find a hotel room nearby the conference hotel at a lower price, they don't stay at the conference hotel. But the society commits a block of rooms at the hotel, conference hotel. And if those are not filled, uh, there are contractual obligations for the so society to, to Take or pay. Either the room is filled by a member who pays his room rate himself or it's paid for by the society if there's that room is not filled. And that's gotten us pretty close to the, the margin. And so uh, uh, for uh, eight, eight or ten years, I've been funding the B Duncan Black Prize, $1,000 every year. 
out of my little slush fund I cr create uh, to run the journal uh, and, the, and Springer funds the Gordon Tullock Prize. Uh, I've he heard from Ed, Ed Lopez that it might be a possibility that they would take over uh, the payment of the uh, uh, Duncan Black Prize in sometime in the near future. I also pay for the plaques that are awarded ev to the winners of the two prizes every year. I'd like to get that off my back. That's not a big expense, but you know, that's something that the society surely should be doing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I want to ask you two more questions here um, that I'm very interested to hear your answers to. And the first is, what do you hope for the future of public choice? What direction would you like to see this scholarly tradition move towards? Uh, just get bigger and better. I mean, I think uh, the changes that I've witnessed uh, since taking over the journal uh, in 2005 is that the number of manuscripts that we get from outside of North America and Western Europe is increasing at a pretty steady rate. I mean, it used to be uh, that the editor in, in Europe was uh, called the European editor, uh, and Bob and Charles were called editors for the rest of the world, but the rest of the world was just the U.S. and Canada, pretty, pretty much. Uh, I, uh, when I took over, uh, and al and also, uh, you know, manuscript processing was very geographically based. I mean, if, if the manuscript originated in Europe, it went to the eventually got to the European editor. If it originated in the rest of the world, eventually got to Charles and Bob. Uh, that's not possible anymore because we get manuscripts from Russia, we get manuscripts from South America, we get manuscripts from Southeast Asia, and South Asia. Uh, China, uh, and uh, so when I took over the journal, I said to the people at Springer, and I, I, I'm employed by Springer, not by anybody at the center that has any say in who's the editor of the journal, and that that's always been true. This is sort of a hand-me-down office where the, your incumbent editor when he or she, well, it's all, all been he's, when he steps down, he recommends to the publisher his successor. And so Gordon recommended Bob and Charles. Bob and Charles recommended me. And eventually I'm going to hang up my uh, red pen and turn it over to somebody else. Uh, but major change I made in taking over the journal was for me to have the final say on all manuscripts. Doesn't matter where they come from. I no longer assign, uh, assign European manuscripts to European referees. I have three associate editors, Pete Leeson here, uh, 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 Keith George Vandenberg at Duke, but he stepped down, and Keith Doherty of Georgia has taken his place as sort of our political science editor. And then in Europe, for the whole time I've been there, Peter Gerald Klickgaard was uh, a political scientist with strong training in, in economics and, and the public choice tradition, the Virginia public choice pr tradition. Uh, and so I just spread the manuscripts around, try to keep assignments to associate editors balanced and uh, uh, assign them by the subject of the paper rather than by its origin. And uh, But then the ones I don't just reject uh, end up going through the editorial process with one of the three associate editors and then coming back to me for a recommendation. I make that recommendation. So we don't have this problem of 
one editor making separate decisions from another set of editors. Uh, and I think that helped a lot. I also, Bob and Charles stepped down because Springer wanted online manuscript processing and they didn't want anything to do with that. So I said, I'll do it, I'll do it. Uh, so uh, directions I see, I hope to see, in the, at least in the medium term, is more public choice analysis of political institutions outside of Europe and the United States, Canada. And we're starting to see that. And, uh, you know, basically just keep doing what we're doing more and better. Uh, <laughs> uh, what I would like somebody to do, Bob Tallis and I wrote a, a book chapter uh, that took, based on Jim Buchanan's writing, most of it, not all, what we thought were the unanswered questions that Jim had left on the table uh, deserving further analysis. I wish more people would take that challenge up, and I'd like somebody to write a similar paper about Gordon. Uh, you know, Gordon wrote a tremendous amount of stuff. Uh, he was on the extensive margin. And he would get he would get finished with a paper or a book, and then he'd just completely go on to something else. And he never plowed that earlier field as deeply as it should be, should have been. So that's what I'd like to see uh, some younger scholar pick up, write a paper similar to what Bob and I did about Jim, write it about Gordon, and. Uh, now, what are the unanswered questions of public choice? Well, why do people vote? That's a big one. We have instrumental theories. We have expressive theories. We don't really have yet a good way of distinguishing between those two. They may be observationally equivalent in some senses or not, but I'd like to see somebody figure out a way that could ex explain why people vote that would generate some testable propositions. Uh, and there's lots of other things. I mean, the work on terrorism is, is, is uh, growing over time. Published a special, two special issues on, on terrorism, on counterterrorism. Uh, Bob uh, Charles published one when he was editor. I think there's much more work that needs to be done in that area public choice thinking about violence, starting with Gordon, social dilemma. I would li I'd like to see uh, more work uh, on uh, countering violence, and I'd also like to see, you know, Bob and I wrote a paper in the Journal of Law and Economics, uh, pushing the public choice model in more deeply into law enforcement and to the judiciary. Uh, we have some inklings of wh what judges do, why judges do what they do, but we don't have a good uh, global explanation of judicial behavior. So I'd like to see some uh, additional work in that area. You know, the I could go on, but uh, I mean, there's so many things that can be done. There's an endless supply of ideas, uh, of things to work on, and what students should do is to pair up with somebody that has those ideas, but doesn't have time to work on them, and uh, get a dissertation done, and then jumpstart a uh, research stream that they can carry them a into a successful academic career. Okay, you foreshadowed my next question uh, perfectly. <laughs> okay. So 
sounds like the first piece of advice for a young scholar, including maybe a graduate student who might be aspiring to work in public choice, would be to ask you for a paper topic yeah. or some or perhaps one of one of many people who have yeah. more ideas than time in the day to write. Yeah. Um, what other kinds of advice would you give to a young scholar? Uh, learn how to write better. <laughs> how do you do that? Uh, practice. Learn by doing. That's why I'm giving these op-ed talks for students out at Utah State. Uh, but I get going to have 450 manuscripts this year. That's down from the peak two years ago with 600 new submissions. But uh, the writing is just getting so terrible. Uh, I blame partly the PC uh, word processing. I think a lot of people uh, sit there and compose on the screen. They get to the bottom of their paper. They print it off and send it to a journal, submit it to a journal. They don't get comments from their peers, other students, uh, faculty members where they're at. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I, I've seen some papers that I seriously question whether the author himself or herself ever read the, read the paper from start to finish. They're poorly organized. So, uh, you know, wh whatever it takes, whether you have to read Peter McCloskey's uh, economical writing, uh, read uh, Strunk and White on language use, uh, uh, but mostly you learn how to write by writing and getting feedback on your writing. So I think that's one piece of advice I would offer to young people. The other thing is, second piece is read stuff that was published more than five years ago. <laughs> uh, there's a tendency. I get a lot of papers that you know the oldest citation was you know the year 2000, the year 2005. Uh, Young people don't read enough. And that's another way of learning how to be a good writer is to be a good reader. Uh, and it doesn't matter what you read. Read fiction, read history, read economics. Uh, get, get the rhythm in your head from reading that can translate out of your hands or your fingers uh, to paper. Uh, so... Uh, you know, it, it, it is really true that there's no, nothing really new in economics since 1776, <laughs> I think. Uh, but people don't read Wealth of Nations anymore. And they certainly don't read the theory of moral sentiments. And we had uh, Vernon Smith, Nobel laureate Vernon Smith, has visited Utah State now three or four times. And he was here earlier this semester. He's been spending two years reading the TMS carefully. And uh, he thinks that a lot of behavioral economics that people think is brand new is actually in the TMS, present bias. And I think the endowment effect is probably there too. Uh, uh, so uh, you know, start with theory of moral sentiments, read the wealth of nations, and read as much in the history of economic thought as you can so that you, you, you don't think that something that's popped into your head is necessarily uh, a new idea or, or a unique idea. It's probably out there somewhere. You can probably polish it around the edges or extend it, extend it in a new direction. But uh, being uh, well read in the history of economic thought, I think, is very important for young scholars if they want to have a solid foundation for building their 
their career. Uh, uh, write, write papers, present them at conferences, present them in your own department, get feedback, uh, but don't send in you know the undigested manuscript that you just finished and haven't read to a journal. It just makes me mad, and it makes any ed any other editor mad. And I spend, I do edit papers, not every paper, but when one of the associate editors recommends the paper be accepted, uh, I t tell them don't recommend it be accepted. There's an option for accept but incomplete. So it comes to me, and then I can read the paper uh, and uh, make editorial corrections substantive suggestions and send it back to the author for one more go. I mean, I'm not going to, I'm going to accept the paper, but I want to make sure the expedition, exposition is clear and that there aren't any obvious fatal flaws in the econometrics or the modeling. Uh, so uh, uh, the young scholars, young students ought to begin the process of interacting with other people, with their research ideas, get feedback, and then send it, send it to me uh, or to whatever journal you think it's appropriate for. Don't send me a paper with a social welfare function in it. Don't uh, send me paper that cites Person and Tavellini and, and Asimoglu and Robinson as if that's new stuff. Because that's the only time I saw Jim Buchanan go ballistic and just be yelling at the top of his voice in the hallway of the Public Choice Center is somebody would mention any of those four names to him. Because they're reinventing the wheel. New political economy is just public choice with a little more math in it. And it's not it's not necessarily a public choice paper if you only cite why nations fail or why uh, you know, some of the other uh, works on constitutional stuff. Uh, it's Virginia public choice, not uh, Harvard public choice or Berkeley public choice. Rochester public choice is fine. Indiana public choice, Bloomington public choice is fine. But don't pretend that you're doing something new if it's already in the calculus of consent or in uh, uh, work that's uh, uh, been published in either in public choice or in constitutional political economy already. So the importance of reading broadly, writing clearly, and I'm also kind of reading between the lines here, hard work actually doing the research about the discipline and the journal and, yeah. the, and, and the background of your field. Are these attitudes and ideas that you held yourself as a young economist at the FTC and at Clemson, or are these things you learned or were taught over time? I, th I think it's learned stuff I've learned over time. The, the, the more, more I've read and the more op opportunity I've had to read and write, that opinion becomes more deeply embedded in my brain. And, uh, you know, if you're not learning something new almost every day, you're not learning. And if you're not writing, you're not thinking. And if those are two characteristics I took from Jim and Bob, those, those, those would be at the top of my list. And also work hard. Work hard. Work every day. Academics don't take vacations. They shouldn't. Because when you're not in class listening to a lecture or you're not in class giving a lecture, you should be reading and writing. Uh, I'm not, well, I leave, you know, I do watch college football games. I do like college baseball. Well, and then you write sports economics yeah, papers about yeah, them. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And, you know, 
advantage when I was doing that was I could write Sports Illustrated off on my tax return. Because I, was, <laughs> I, I, I need, especially the swimsuit issue, I needed, you know, to do research on baseball and football, so I needed that that publication. As it was essential to my research <laughs> research stream at the time. Uh, Subsidies everywhere, <laughs> public choice everywhere. Yeah, that's right, exactly. Uh, well, thank you so much for sitting down to talk with me today, Bill. This has been a really fantastic conversation. <coughs> well, thank you for inviting me. I hope I uh, look forward to spending a few more days here on campus in this nice new facility, and um, and going down to our nation's capital to the Southern Economic Association meeting. Uh, and uh, let me also put in a plug uh, for the Independent Institute while I'm at it. I'm, I've been the research director there for uh, roughly five years, I guess. We publish a journal called the Independent Review. I don't, I'm an associate editor of that, but I really that's just an honorary title. Robert Waffles, uh, Chris Coyne, and Mike Munger do the heavy lifting on for that journal. But it's a good place, you know, if uh, to get stuff published. We do do, you know, political economy, public choice, even Austrian stuff has appeared there. But thinking later on in your career, we publish a lot of books, and we have comparative advantage over most book publishers in the sense we have a very thorough review process up front. We have professional copy editors and uh, a really do good job promoting the book when, when it's finally out. And we, and we keep in print, keep those books in print. I mean, my 1997 book on excise taxes which I did for them in 1997, is still available. Uh, uh, and, you know, most other publishers, given the, it's not a New York Times bestseller, so it, uh, but it, and most publishers would not keep it in print more than five years. We do. And we do a lot of really good promotion. Uh, you get your name. Of course, you have to pass through me. Uh, I, I advise on all the manuscripts. And uh, so the same things I said about good writing before. For journal articles, it's just as important for books. Because uh, it's not well written, uh, we're not going to be able to make any money selling it. Uh, and we'll have to, all the, all the, copies we printed will be in a warehouse somewhere gathering dust. But it'll be available if somebody wants to buy it. We, they'll get it out there. So we have to add to the advice. Not only do you work hard at writing and reading and collaborate with senior scholars, also publish in the independent review yes. and public choice. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and CPE is our sister journal, Constitutional Political Economy. And frequently, uh, when a paper comes to public choice that's more appropriate for that journal, I, you know, I recommend that the manuscript be I reject it for public choice and say, but hey, send it to CPE, or hey, send it to the Independent Review. Uh, it'll be a better home for you for that paper. All right, fantastic. All right, good All deal. Right. Yeah, well, thank you, Bill Shugart. Thank you, Jamie Lemke. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Hayek Program podcast. To learn more about the research, scholars, and work of the Hayek Program, visit hayek.mercatus.org. For more information about graduate student fellowship opportunities for students at Mason as well as at universities across the globe, please visit students.mercatus.org. We hope you recommend students to our programs or consider applying yourself.